As I said when I delivered the sermon for this morning's worship service, I was actually given a, another sermon, which is very unusual. Uh, and I say given because it seemed to just fall upon me as I was finishing or nearly finished with the sermon that I shared this morning. But this is a, a longer message because it is related to uh, the inclusion of LGBTQ persons in the life of St. Paul's. And I want to share where I've come to and have you uh, be able to reflect on that. And I wanted to begin by reminding you that our scripture focus for this week that I preached on, uh, the other message, from Luke 14 included the following uh, verses uh, from verses 25 to, to 27. Now, large crowds were traveling with Jesus. And he turned to them and said, whoever, wants, whoever comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even life itself, cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry the cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Last fall, as my wife was completing her certificate in alcohol and other drug studies at San Diego City College, she had the opportunity to complete her required internship at Stepping Stone of San Diego, a residential treatment center in the City Heights area. Stepping Stone specializes in serving the LGBTQ community. But as they express on their website, we serve the LGBTQ community, but our doors are, and always will be, open to all. Because straight people are in the program, and because they hired my wife, I know they're telling the truth when they say they have open doors. So after completing her internship in December, Jen was offered a permanent full-time position. I cannot begin to express how extraordinarily proud I am of her. In so many ways, I see how Jen's work aligns with her deep faith in God's boundless love and grace for all people, love and grace that Christ followers are called to demonstrate as servants of the greatest servant. Yet I feel tremendous sadness thinking about what the stories must be like for the clients who Jen sees. Is there a father who regularly tried to beat the girl out of his son beginning when the boy was in elementary school because he, began, he was a bit too feminine? Or, or a, a transgender grandchild whose grandmother said something like, you know, I'll always love you, but I'm just so sad that I will not see you in heaven. Is it any wonder that substance abuse and other self-harming behaviors, including suicide, become an escape from such deeply wounding experiences? We know that troubled adults most often have unresolved childhood trauma and pain. Well, I know congregants here hold differing views on LGBTQ inclusion in the church, 
the extent of inclusion. I would hope that everyone sees how such behaviors are out of step with the gospel, falling far short of the Christ-likeness we are called to pursue in our lives. Indeed, such behaviors and words aimed at LGBTQ persons are opposite the great commandment to love God and neighbor as ourselves. I also believe that such behaviors and words deeply wound the heart of God. Not only, not only because of the tremendous damage it does to those who are LGBTQ, but because of the damage wrought upon the souls of those who inflict such damage. Prior to the pandemic, I'd been meeting with, with people to hear about their hopes and fears for St. Paul's as our denomination struggles with issues related to LGBTQ inclusion. I've been able to talk to about 200 people and I know the perspective of, of about 40 more people who've not been shy about sharing their views one way or the other. As I have previously outlined, we have people in our congregation who would be described as conventional and non-accepting of LGBTQ persons. And then we have people who are conventional but they are accepting. And then we have people who are emergent accepting. And then we have people who are emergent affirming. If you, if you never heard the presentation I gave on this back in 2019, please email the church and get a link to that seminar. There's actually two, but it was in the second seminar that I uh, described those terms and, and talked about them more fully. But there have been three surprises for me in the meetings I've had with church members. And, and the first is this, that 70 to 75 percent of the people that I've met with fall into the la latter three categories. Conventional accepting, Emergent accepting or emergent affirming. I had guessed the split might be closer to 50-50 and that the majority might be conventional non-accepting. That's just not what I found. Second, even among those who describe themselves or who I would describe as conventional, non-accepting, very firm in their views, there were some of those folks who, who seemed accommodating. That is, they don't necessarily think that they'd leave the church if, for example, it blessed same-sex unions, if that became a possibility. In other words, what they said were, is that they don't envision themselves telling a minister what they can and can't do as a minister uh, with regards to, to this. Or, or requiring that the church has to do only what they think of as appropriate and aligned with their view on this. As one said, that's just not my business. Or another said, well, that's beyond my pay grade. And another said, I, to me, I trust that whatever you do will be because you believe it's the right thing to do. And I'll be okay with that because I trust you. I valued that. Third, there were plenty of couples where one had a different view than their spouse. The surprising thing was that there were quite a number. <laughs> Interestingly, 
it did not seem to be a deal breaker to either one of them that they thought differently than their spouse did. They could love and each other and, and stay together in spite of their differences. How novel. Well, one of the couples that I met with uh, during this time were Don and Donna Patrick. And, and as you know, Don very recently passed away. And like many of those that I had met with, I did not know I, at all where the Patricks stood on the issue. I might think my guess was they were, might be conventional, non-accepting people. But Don made it clear that he'd almost left St. Paul's when the General Conference of our denomination voted in 2019 uh, to retain uh, policies that he deemed hurtful to LGBTQ persons and their family. I know that Don would want you to know why. And I want to be clear that what I'm about to share is with Donna's permission also. You see, Don was adopted. His adoptive parents could not conceive, and so that is how they became his parents. As sometimes happens following an adoption, his adoptive mother became pregnant and gave birth to his younger brother, Johnny. Don shared that beginning in adolescence and continuing into adulthood, his brother struggled with sobriety. On one occasion, perhaps the second or third time that his brother had been in a, in a treatment center, Don's brother came to him and disclosed to him that his struggle to remain sober was, was due to his effort to suppress his attraction to other men. He was gay. At this, Don said that he turned to his brother and said, Johnny, you are my family. And you know that I will always love you, but, but, I don't want you anywhere near my kids. Don paused his story at this point to say that he had bought into the common assumption that equated being gay with being a pedophile. And I, too, will pause here to say that as a former deputy probation officer and a former child protective services worker, I did both, I suspect that many men, in particular, who are most vocal about their non-accepting views on homosexuality were themselves victims of childhood sexual abuse perpetrated by an older male relative. Abuse that they've never been able to deal with because of wrongly equating what happened to them as a homosexual encounter. My suspicion may be wrong, but it doesn't come out of nowhere. But what I really want to say is pastorally as I can, is that if you were the victim of, of a molestation as a child, I am, I'm so sorry. And no matter how old you are, how long you've been carrying that secret, I would really like to be as helpful in healing that as I possibly can be. But as Don said, homosexuality is not the same as that. 
Nun then shared how his brother had eventually been able to achieve and maintain sobriety and had even established a successful program to help those who were struggling with addictions. Now this was in Oklahoma, and obviously this is some time ago where, where the story is 50s, 60s, 70s that I'm telling. Well, eventually, his brother was asked by the city of Houston to come there and, and set up an alcohol and drug treatment program. There, which he did. And then, on Christmas Eve, in 1977, Don got a call. He and Donna were living in Oklahoma. The call was from the police department in Houston requesting that Don come to Texas to identify his brother's body. His brother had been murdered. And Don and Donna had to go on Christmas Eve to tell Don's parents that Johnny, his brother, had been murdered. And that was before he flew down, if I'm remembering the story correctly. But at this point in our conversation, Don said that what he was about to share with me and in front of Donna was something that he'd never shared with anyone, including Donna. And then he shared some pretty horrific details. And I don't want to share those. I don't want to share what he recounted. But he did say that the police said that his brother had likely been targeted because he was gay. That, that this murder was a hate crime. Now what Don said to me next will stay with me forever. I can see this so clearly. With, with tear-filled eyes and with his voice choking back those tears, Don said, Pastor Rob, I never got to tell my brother that I was wrong. I never got to tell Johnny how wrong I was. Don finished, I now know that being gay has nothing to do with being a child molester. I was ignorant. It's two different things, and I just don't think there's anything wrong with being gay. And then as he finished, Don asked a question that had clearly haunted him for so long. Do you think my brother would forgive me? How many years had Don's soul been wrestling with that question? How many times had he prayed from release from what he'd said to his brother? How many times had he wished he'd never said what he said? Words that he could not take back after his brother had been killed. As I said, cruel behaviors and harmful words towards those who are LGBTQ not only damage their souls, souls that are as precious to God as our own, but also scar the soul of those who inflict, those of us who inflict such harm. And I've seen this many, many times throughout my ministry. I assured Don, and I certainly believe it to be true, that his brother would not want Don to be carrying around that guilt any longer. So why am I, I sharing this? To be honest, if I could have avoided it, I probably would have. 
believe me. <laughs> Indeed, if you listened earlier today, I already delivered another sermon for our online worship. I am simply not a progressive social justice warrior, nor am I a conservative culture warrior. I do know how to fight, but I am not a warrior seeking to do battle whenever there's an opportunity. Because it is enough of a battle for me, enough of a struggle for me to strive to be a barely good enough disciple of Jesus. It is enough for me to work out my own salvation with fear and trembling and not get caught up in other things. And so as I listened to Jesus say, as he does in Luke 14, 27, whoever does not carry the cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. It, it hit me, it hit me in the depths of my soul that this is the cross that Jesus is calling me to pick up and carry today, from this day forward. That in the remaining time that I am privileged to be a pastor here or anywhere else, I will do nothing that adds harm to LGBTQ persons and their families. And in fact, I realize that this cross that I need to pick up will require me to push back against those who would continue to do such harm, who I hear say or watch do hurtful things. I'm called to be an ally alongside LGBTQ persons. And this is in large part because I am concerned about the scarring of those who continue to justify doing harm, often based upon what they believe the Bible says. Now let me say three things about how I have arrived at this posture as I take an inventory of my journey to this. First, over the years, I have listened to or overheard the narratives of LGBTQ persons and their families. Stories like Don shared with me, but many others besides, many that are direct, and I consider it such an honor that some of these people took the risk of sharing their stories with me, a white, heterosexual, Christian minister in a denomination that is not yet fully inclusive, a denomination that says open hearts, open minds, open doors, but with a huge asterisk. Second, I have had to acknowledge throughout, well, that over our history, the Christian church has gotten things wrong. Many, many times. Usually based upon what we say the Bible says. But the church is not the center of the universe, is it? Women are not property to be exchanged from father to husband. Anti-Semitism is not something that Christians should be engaged in. 
Slavery is not ordained by God. The forced conversion and displacement of indigenous people was not an act of Christian charity, though the European missionaries claim that it was. Being male is not a requirement for preaching the gospel, not for Pastor Susan, nor even for Beth Moore. The racial segregation of public schools which continue, was continuing less than, well, less than 100 years ago. It was not established in God's word, as some said it was. These are just a few of the examples, the things we've been wrong about based upon Scripture. And to not consider the possibility that we might be wrong again reveals our incurable hubris. That we have yet to adopt a posture of humility that allows us to listen to those on the margins as Jesus always did. To admit that we've been wrong before and then to ask, have we, could we, might we have been mistranslating, misreading, misunderstanding, and misinterpreting Scripture yet again. And this is the third thing that has led me to pick up this cross today. As Jesus calls me to do if I want to follow him, which I want to do with all my heart. In listening to the narratives of LGBTQ persons in their families, in humbly acknowledging that we Christians have been very wrong before, this has led me to read, read Scripture to see if we might be wrong, if I might be wrong. Now, over the course of my ministry, I have done a deep dive into the debated, uh, debated text several times. This box holds almost all of my files and books uh, that I've kept, not the ones I haven't kept over the years on this debate, homosexuality. And until recently, I'd felt that aside from disingenuous and mean-spirited mean arguments, both sides had similar weight. Well, maintaining pastoral compassion for LGBTQ persons was a no-brainer. My reading of scriptural arguments from both sides had kept me in the middle, urging people on both sides to at least acknowledge that the other side had sound scriptural reasons for the p position that they held. And I, I still urge such a posture. But within the last year, maybe a little longer, the weight has shifted for me. Because as I have said before, I read Scripture through a conservative lens. And because I read Scripture through a conservative lens, that what it says means what it meant when it was written, I am persuaded that on those very few occasions, six or seven, when Scripture addresses same-sex activity 
It is not talking about monogamous committed relationships of fidelity between two adults who love each other, which is what we're talking about today. Scripture is talking primarily, I believe, about two things. Sexual acts that are exploitive, out of control, and often involving abuses of power. As in a master over a slave of either gender. Or, number two, sexual acts connected with idol worship. Especially temple prostitution. Altering something that Beth Moore recently said about the mistreatment of women in the Southern Baptist Church. And I'm putting her quote on the screen to show you where I'm changing it. Because she was talking about women. I'm going to change it to refer to LGBTQ persons. It turns out that scripture is not the reason... For the colossal disregard, disrespect, and outright contempt we visited upon LGBTQ persons. Scripture is only an excuse for that. But sin is the reason. Well, as I've said, I've read lots and lots of materials uh, over the year from every side. But the more recent items that I've read that have tilted me in this direction include uh, a letter to my congregation by Ken Wilson out of the Vineyard, very conservative denomination. Holy Love by Stephen Harper, a retired professor at Asbury, from Asbury Theological Seminary, the most conservative Methodist seminary, certainly, that we have. Uh, and he was uh, canceled <laughs> following his uh, retirement. He had been Professor uh, Emeritus, but now he's expunged because he's changed his views. And, and, uh, and an article in this book, uh, which I shared by Megan DeFranza, called Journeying from the Bible to Christian ethics in search of common ground. Now, I mentioned these, these three in particular because all three of these, they're very, they had been in very, and perhaps very, it still are, very conservative evangelical Christians. But each of these authors had long held the opposite view from what they now believed. And they had changed to accommodate culture they change their views based on engagement of Scripture. And in changing their views, it has cost them standing in their communities, as I described. Ken Wilson was kicked out of the Vineyard Church after, you know, decades of service. Their testimony reveals how they have faithfully engaged Scripture to arrive at a different place. And I find their reflections on Scripture to be honest and persuasive. Another book I'd mention is, is Paul Among the People. It's written by um, a translator, scholar of classics. Not a biblical scholar, though probably very capable of that as well. Uh, her name is Sarah Rudin. And Rudin... Uh, what she shares is writings composed around the same time uh, that the Apostle Paul was writing uh, his letters. And, and in that cultural milieu that, where he was writing his letters. And, and what these writings, these non-biblical writings that she shares, reveal is the truly dark context of sexual exploitation, predatory uh, sexual exploitation uh, of boys by heterosexual males, which Paul found both unnatural and repulsive, rightly so. In fact, the surrounding culture 
Paul was engaging in, celebrated this as the apex of male virility for heterosexual men, having sex with as many willing and unwilling partners of either gender, of almost any age, as possible. It was dark. As Rudin notes, this society pressured men into sexual brutality. That, I think, is what Paul was addressing. I could go on, but, but I think that's enough. I hope that this does not need to be said, but I'll say it anyway. You do not need to agree with me. Um, but as your pastor, which I hope for everyone, I, I can continue to be. I urge you, number one, listen to the narratives of LGBTQ persons and their families. Don't just talk about them or the issue. Engage the actual people. Number two, own and admit that, that Christians, we, we Christians, have been wrong before, often disastrously so. And then three, re-engage Scripture to confirm not just the side of the argument you already agree with, but also to ensure that you truly understand the arguments made by the side you disagree with. But above all, do no harm. Do no harm. Just stop. Friends, I am convinced that our church St. Paul's can remain the great and welcoming church that, that people, have visitors, guests, always say that it is. That, and the way that it's been for the last 25 years or so. But I do see that this will require many of us to see that this issue should never have become the deal breaker. That it seems to be. Remember how novel it is that marriages, they can disagree? <laughs> it should not be the deal breaker. It seems to be. And I would hope that, as it has been, that our doors are and will always be open to all. Because we do have good news of great joy. For all people. And we do have some work to do. Amen.